Praise the name of the living God. And good afternoon in the name of Jesus. Shall we pray? Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that through the teaching today, you grant unto us more and more of the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus so that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened. Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that through this, we will know about the riches of your inheritance, which are in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of your power toward all of us who are believers. And this power was demonstrated through Jesus Christ when God the Father raised him from the dead. By that power, Father, we have the knowledge of what you have done. And Father, pray that by that revelation, we shall cause this revelation to grow so large on our inside that nothing else matters anymore. We give you the praise, Father. We give you the glory. I come against every negative influence of the enemy lurking in our minds. I stop and I do not permit the operation of the spirit of the enemy through the influence of dullness of perception slowness to understand the spirit of indifference the spirit of bigotry the spirit of hardness of heart the spirit of religion the spirit of traditional beliefs all these things that do not line up with how jesus taught the disciples after resurrection and which the which the apostles followed and wrote down as our apostolic mandate which is found in the epistles from Acts to Revelation. May that awareness be even more stronger today by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you for that anointing today in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. This is me, your host, Pastor Fred Abeka, and Lady Patience Abeka, and all the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful faithfuls of you guys here on the platform and also FGCI um, worldwide. We say welcome to today's edition of our teaching devotional, which is called Epic Gnosis Daily. Every day we are discovering the revelation knowledge of Christ written by the apostles, which is our mirror and which is our sailor boss. The music that is being played in the background I don't have, or we don't have any copyright claims to it. So that if we should go into the public domain, it is just purely for the purpose of our teaching. And we are not selling anything and nothing more, nothing less. So before we start and go on, just a quick, to send a quick reminder of those that should join us, praise the name of the living God. I'll put the topic there already, what we are dealing with. And look at the lesson, look at where we are, look at where we are, look at where we are absolutely a cracker on this topic absolutely a cracker the true nature of god as seen in christ and that area is so critical as seen in christ as seen in christ is so critical for us to understand very very important sometimes when i'm sending the reminders because it's a broadcast you must see it repetitively on your phone it's not you i'm just trying to let you go around <laughs> so, so bear with me that's why sometimes i see it multiple times in front because maybe i'm reminding others because i'll put you all with the exception of a few as a cluster so you when i send it it goes once at the same time all right so here we are the true nature of god as in Christ. And let me take this opportunity to welcome you all individually, Sister Hetty, Sister Sheila, Sister Ruth, Sister Nina. Faithful you are. Bless you. Very good. So now let us go into today. We're going to cover quite a little bit more of technical ground because now that at least you guys have understood the concept, I'm just now want to deal with the future. And probably by the grace of God, next week we shall probably bring this topic to an end and move on to salvation and evangelism. We'll deal with salvation. What is salvation? When is a man born again? Can a person lose salvation? We'll go through all that taken by in more detail, looking at certain things. Then we shall look at evangelism. Why, why is evangelism so difficult for a lot of people? When we go to evangelism, what exactly do we say? 
all those things we shall deal with all that how to approach different types of people you know some people you know philosophers educated people non-educated people, working people we we'll deal with all that so that our evangelism will be effective so the, the our vision this year is to bring souls 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 and train them souls and train them because now we are moving into the area of now we are going to open up into virtual cell groups we're going to start opening cell groups and most of you here will definitely be the leaders that's why i'm training you like this so don't take this these studies lightly at all every born again believer is called let me say it again every born again believer is called there's nothing like i have a special calling no we are all called how do we know that hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 says that it talks about the fact that you know beloved brethren who share in the apostolic calling you see he calls us apostle we are all called who share in the calling of christ we all share just that some have been given some area you know to oversee some have been given some but we are all called because the message the main message is salvation by faith in christ jesus and that is the duty of everybody every believer nobody is exempt and when we get to heaven we shall be rewarded first on the number of souls that you brought into the kingdom number two we shall also be rewarded in terms of how we kept the message without mixing it up with wrong doctrine that is the number three we shall also be rewarded on walking in love as well and then number four on anything that we did to contribute to the gospel anything that we did to contribute to the growth of the gospel will be the four main areas that we shall receive our speech and prize giving day. So now let us jump into this, the true nature of God seen in Christ, lesson number 77. Yes, exactly, look at that, 77, 77 lessons, 77 lessons, it's not a joke. It shows you that Bible study is not supposed to be rushed. Bible study is painstaking. You need to take your time, be patient, be humble, be teachable, and then submit yourself to what Jesus laid down. When people don't know this, they'll come and hear you teach something. They've not heard the whole thing. They get offended and they don't come anymore. You know, such ones, Paul calls them spurious people. They are clouds without rain. You know, they are windless. They are not in because of the message. They are in because of their own personal gain. You know, they don't want anything to change their mind or what they, they have believed that something is working for them. They think that following God is like juju or it's like some maraboutage or it's like some, some you know, you know, fetish, fetishism. They don't know that the whole thing has to do with a relationship. And God is seeking to unveil the relationship with you step by step. So look at that lesson 77. So what are we, notice the title, the true nature of God as seen in Christ. If you can't see it in Christ, it cannot be possible. So we are investigating into the assumptions of God's na true nature. That is the problem we are dealing with now. Most of the ideas that people have about God are assumptions. Like we studied yesterday, a very good example was Job. Job made very strange assumptions about God. We said that it was very exciting. Job, Job said so many things, but they were not actually from God. It was his own mindset. And sometimes the problem we have when we read the Bible is to be able to distinctively make or separate what the person said from what God said. But because we think it is in the Bible, we think that God is saying it. That is where the error is. It's not everything that is in the Bible is what God said it. Even though the Bible said all scripture is given. He didn't say all scripture is inspired by. He didn't say, and so he said it's given by. There's a big difference. There is a very big difference. There is a very big difference. He didn't say given by. He said inspired by. He didn't say given by. He said inspired by. And there's a difference. See, to say that it is everything in the Bible is inspired by God, then it will mean that it is God that inspired Satan to tempt Adam and Eve. If we say everything in the Bible is inspired by God, then it is God that inspired the people of Sodom and Gomorrah to commit Sodomy. If we say everything in the Bible is inspired, because the word inspiration means to breathe into, to breathe into, to breathe into. You know, like you are there and you say, oh, I'm inspired to write a poem. That means you got something from within see an idea you know came so to say that everything the bible is inspired by 
then you are alluding to the fact that it was God that told Solomon to marry 800 women and 400 side chicks. So there's a difference between inspired by and given by. The Bible was given by. That means that the whole things do, that happened because you and I were not there. God gave everything raw. All the incidents that happened raw, as a raw, as a raw fact. It's like raw data. Do you understand? It's like somebody gives you um, um, material, like you were, you were a seamstress. Okay, and the person says, sew the dress for me. Sew the dress for me. They bring you raw material. So that the giving there is what we call giving by. But you now are not going to take the raw material. Then you're not going to use all the material, are you? You're not going to use all the material. You're going to begin to snip, snip it, put some down, cut it, shape it, design it, sew it together, add some things, take some things. That's it. That is, that is the same thing in the Bible. The Bible is given to us first. The whole thing that happened from Genesis to Revelation is given. But inside them now, we have to shape it. We have to put it in its proper places. That's what the Bible says that study to show yourself a proof. A workman, so there's work like the tailor. Now, now there's work to be done. Now you have to begin to, you have to begin to sift. Who said this? Who didn't say this? Who said this? Who didn't say this? Why did this one say this? Why did this one say this? Who did he speak to? Who didn't he speak to? So he said, a workman, there's work. The Greek word is ergatis. A workman, that does not need to be ashamed. If you don't study it well, you'll be ashamed to talk about it. You'll be ashamed to explain. You can't even explain. Who does not need to be ashamed? Watch. Correctly dividing the word of truth. Correctly. That means putting everything in its right place. Because the message is one, but when you come and meet it, it looks so many things, but it's pointing to one thing. And that word, correctly dividing the word, is the Greek word, ototomio. Ototomio. So you must ototomio the word. In other words, it is given to you raw like a material to sew. Now, as a master sewer, you sit down, you know the shape of the person, you begin to cut. You begin to draw, you begin to put, you know that this one is for the hand, this one is for is for the bust, this one is for the lapel, this one is for the hem, this one is for the buttons. You see, you're putting everything, you see. But if you don't know as a master tailor and they bring the material, the person will come back three weeks and say, what rubbish is this? What are you doing? Why, why, why did you put the button at the back? Why, why did you put why did you put the lapel on the on the side of the arm? Oh, why is the arm rather around the waist? see that and that is how many people do the bible they have placed everything wrongly not knowing that jesus himself has shown us how to place everything after resurrection in luke 24 very important very very important so when people don't know how to place or to show the material of the word they make assumptions they make assumptions which causes a mess completely so that is why i put it investigating into the assumptions of God's nature. We are investigating all these assumptions. So if the Bible was given by raw, God just, they just got to, okay, write this without no explanation. This thing happened, write it. This thing happened, write it. This thing happened, write it. But no explanation was given as to why, how, when. You understand? It is until we, until Paul the apostle came, until Jesus came after resurrection, showed the, the disciples that all those things is about this. And this is how you have to explain it. And they did start it. Then later Paul came. And Paul also got the greater revelation and explained it the same way. All were taken out of the Old Testament. All the epistles were taken out of the Old Testament. But nobody knew how to take it out until Jesus came to explain where to put everything correctly. So the correctly dividing the word is ototomio. Put everything in the right place perspective and that's what we have done haven't we done that we have autotomued this thing about does god have anger i've shown you right from the beginning where the problem is how things are why it is so why is it the wrath of god why is it the vengeance of god god has no anger we have autotomued put everything in its right place like cooking jollof rice that is how you do the word and when you begin to follow that pattern that's why i say always start in the epistles when you start in the epistles from Acts to the book of Jude and you read it, you read it, Acts to the book of Jude will show you how to auto-tomio. It will show you how to put everything 
correct, like we see in our country, pe -pe -pe, the right way. I mean, to fall right. You will know. You will know. Because you read something in Hebrew and read that, ah, but in the in the Old Testament, it was like this. So it cannot be like this. Everything begin to fall. Everything begin to fall. Everything begin to fall. Then that's what we call correctly dividing the word. Ototomio. So many people don't know how to ototomio the word based on what Jesus said. And then they just take single Bible verses, single Bible verses, single Bible verses, single Bible verses. They don't read before. They don't read after. They don't read the whole thing so that they can ototomio in the right direction. Glory. I hope you understood that. I just said that to help you. So let us go into today's teaching. And I'm going to travel a little bit with this. So please pay critical attention. I'm going to go over some Bible verses that you've heard me use already. But I'm, I'm looking for something. So I want you to take, pay critical attention to those Bible verses. So let's go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. I'm just going to go through just to refresh your mind. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message of God's promised revelation so it was promised since genesis it was promised since genesis but it was it was already in god's sin but it was promised the word promise is the greek word epangelia epangelia that means a self-fulfilling promise it does not require any help it does not require any help. So when the Bible says that God made a covenant with Abraham, people understand it wrongly. The covenant is the promise, Evangelia. That means that he, God, promised to fulfill it himself. That is what it means. All that he needed from Abraham was to believe. That is all. For example, let me do a bit of biology. For example, in the case of a husband and a wife, what, the, what does the woman do? The woman receives. But when the woman receives, does she do anything else? No. Once the seed gets into, into the womb, it begins to fulfill itself. Now that, that cell be, becomes divided into two, then from two to four to six to eight to 16 to 32, it becomes a zygote, it becomes a fetus, it grows, it multiplies, it attaches itself to the uterus of the womb, it begins to multiply, then the brain develops, the eye develops, the nose develops. What is the woman doing? Nothing. She only received. She only received. She's just eating and receiving. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Glory to God. So it's the same thing with when God spoke to Abraham. He's not telling Abraham to do something to let it come to pass, okay? So when he gave it to Abraham, the, the promise was evangelia, self-fulfilling. That Don't worry, all I need for you is just to agree with me because you are in planet Earth. A man has authority in planet Earth. Just agree with me. Once you agree with me, then I will do the rest. It was later that the law came, the law now depended on two people. That is why it was brought by angels and Moses became the mediator between God and man. Because now man, because of sin, man had to perform. But the original plan was with Abraham. In the case of Abraham, all that Abraham did was to believe. So God was telling Abraham that, don't worry, salvation, I will do it myself. That is the meaning of vengeance is mine. I will fulfill the deal with taking away sin. It's my, it's my job. All I need from you is to believe. So Jesus will come. So this is the message of God's promised revelation, which we have heard from him and now announce to you that God is light. That means that that is the consistency of God's character. He is holy, that is different. His message is truthful. He is perfect in righteousness. Watch and in him. That is since there is no darkness at all, which means no sin, one, no wickedness, two, no imperfection. Then let's go on to John chapter 1, verse 18, from verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace, the unearned, and the favor of God, and to came through Jesus Christ. Verse 18, no one has seen God, his essence, his divine nature at any time. No one is no one. He was talking about until Christ came. But that was the subject of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was God. And later he said the word became flesh or the word became human. And that was the promise that God will become a man like us. No one has seen God at any time. His essence, his divine nature at any time. So Adam never saw God. Noah never saw God. Abraham never saw God. Moses never saw God. Never. There it is. No one has seen God. So if you have never seen you, describe him. The one and only begotten, that, that is the nation who is in the 
who is in the intimate presence of the Father. The word intimate there is, is a Greek word called pos. That is the same nature. He has, take note of that sentence, he has explained, not going to, he has explained. The Greek word of the explain is exegomai. He is not going to explain, he has done it already. That means all that Jesus did in his earthly work was to explain the true nature of God to man in everything he did. You understand that? He said that he has explained him and then the amplifier put it in brackets, interpreted one, they couldn't interpret God. See, they couldn't interpret God. Revealed to all past tense, the awesome wonder of the father. So Jesus is the father in the flesh. <laughs> Jesus is the father. That's why I told Philip, Philip, Philip said, show us the father, then we'll be, we'll be okay. He said, Philip, 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 have I been with you all this while that you don't know who the father is? In other words, the father is standing before you, but I am praying to a father so that because your revelation mind is not open, I need to do something like that because if I said I'm the father, you cannot grasp it. I am the father in the flesh. There's no father anywhere. Don't look for any father. I am the father. He said, interpreted and revealed the awesome wonder of the father. He has revealed not going to. So Jesus is the father revealed. The father that they did not see in the Old Testament. The God that they could not see in the Old Testament. He came to put a face to it and correct their mindset, their wrong assumptions and their wrong impressions because of some of the writings of the Old Testament. Can you get that? Let's go on. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 talking about Jesus. His incarnation and his resurrection. This is what we call the exaltation of Christ. Colossians 1, 15. He, that is Jesus, is the exact living image. Did you see that? The living image. The essential manifestation of the unseen God. Talking about it in the Old Testament. The God that they could not see. Jesus is the, is, the, is the physical scene of him. The visible representation of the invisible. The firstborn. Now notice that term. There's only begotten and there's the firstborn. This one here, the firstborn is the Greek word prototokos. It means model, type. The preeminent one, the sovereign and the originator of all creation. Verse, verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, that refers to angels, before the, some of them before the fall. All things were created and exist through him, that is, by his activity and for him. Verse 17, and he himself existed and is before all things. And he and in him all things hold together. He is the controlling, cohesive force of the universe. Glory to God. That is clear. So, which means that based on these three Bible verses, passages, 1 John 1, 5, John 1, 18, Colossians 1, 15, 16, 17, it supposes clearly that God is Christ. Christ became man who displayed who God is. And in, in that means if you want to look at the exact nature of God, look at Christ. So if you read somewhere where you say that, oh, and God killed, and God, look at Christ. Oh, and it's written somewhere that Avengers came from God. Look at Christ. That's what he's trying to say. Everything God did was to cancel out those things. Everything that God did in Christ was to correct that thinking. In other words, because the Bible was not complete, was not yet together, God has to come down in person. Because if it was written, they would not believe it. He had to come down in person to let them know that, guys, I am not, I'm not the one that did the, the flood though. I'm not the one that did the Sodom and Gomorrah fire. I'm not the one that killed the Egyptians. I'm not the one that, I'm not the one. So see it in Christ. Until that is settled, you struggle with this topic. And let me tell you something. There is nothing to God that we can see again outside Christ. So some people say, oh, you know, we have not seen all of God yet. No, he has said, he has declared. Jesus is the boundary of God. If Jesus didn't do anything, God would never do. If Jesus has done, God will not do anything outside it. Never. So which means that when we come across certain Bible passages in the Old Testament that use the word 
I, he killed vengeance, then that means we are, we are now dealing with, I've explained that to you so many times, we are dealing with one, the fact that the mindset of the people that wrote it, they were spiritually dead. Two, we are dealing with translation problem. Three, we are dealing with language problem. Four, we are also dealing with the fact that Satan was obscured in the writings of the Old Testament, but they didn't know that. Five, we are dealing from the fact that sin is what brought all these things. It's not from God. Sin brought wrath, anger, death, sickness, disease, spiritual death, physical death, and all, all what they call shebang. <laughs> see that? That is why I always have to start beginning at Moses' writing and see, was it there? No, it's not there. So I want to submit to you, don't also take that position of thinking that, oh, God is uh, like, it's like uh, he's got emotions and it's just that he's trying to hold it. It's not in God at all. Didn't we just read it? No darkness at all. Oh, not even an atomic drop. So we are dealing with translation problem. We are dealing with when you come across that. This thing that I'm explaining to you, if you can understand it, you are, if you can understand it, you are 500 miles away from those that are still in Bible school. I've saved you three years or four years of Bible school. If you understand what I'm saying, I've done all the work for you. So now let us now go further into certain aspects of where we left off yesterday and continue to show that it is all about language problem. It is all about translation problem. It is all about mindset of either the speakers or the writers of the Old Testament. It's all about the fact that they did not know Old Testament writers. Up to the time Jesus came, you don't know that there was a being called behind the scenes. Capish? Let's go on. All right. Let's take the journey. Follow me. This is a bit more technical. So follow me. Follow me. Therefore, when we talked about Job yesterday, we, we said that, that the Satan was mentioned 15 times only in the Old Testament. Of all the 15 times, 12 of them were mentioned in the book of Job. And then the rest were mentioned in other books of the Bible, in, chron in the book of Chronicles and also the book of Psalms. But the name the Lord appears 6,521 times in the entire Old Testament. Therefore, it can be observed that the word or the personality, Satan, was referenced by the writers of the books of the Old Testament and several times was referenced figuratively for God's absence, for God's inactivity in the midst of evil and misfortune. But God was not the one that did it. Hence, the dilemma or the dilemma of clearly, that's the point, of clearly recognizing Satan as the destroyer in the Old Testament books of the Bible is very, very important. A lot of people forget that. See, they forget that. And that's why they all jump to conclusion about Sodom and Gomorrah, the flood and all that. All those things came about as a natural disaster because of the fall of man and God could see the disaster coming ahead of time. And he decided to rather save man by telling them to build an ark or telling Lot to be there and preach to the people or getting out of that place. The same also with Pharaoh. He said that disaster coming. There's too much occultic practice in the land. We'll see it today in the land of Egypt and Satan is closing in and God didn't want his people to be polluted with that idol worship. So he said, let the people go, so they come out of that. So from the incident in the two accounts presented above, 2 Samuel 24 and 1 Chronicles 21, which we read, which talked about one of them in 2 Samuel said that Satan entered into the heart of David to number the people. But when you come to 1 Chronicles 21, the same event, it says that it was God that provoked David to do that. So we see that there's something wrong by the translators. So now let us now examine now, it is suffices to say that much of what Satan was responsible for in the Old Testament must have been accrued to God as his anger because of the explanations that I'm giving to you. They didn't know. So now we're going to examine a few other plagues, incidents in the Old Testament. And let us see that you see once again that the Old Testament writers, because they did not know that Satan was the one behind the scenes, they wrote it as God is the one that is causing it and used a causative verb instead of a permissive verb. Permissive means that the people decided not to believe the message. The people decided to reject the message and the people made a choice outside believing God. And when they do that, you are outside the protection of God regarding salvation. 
So let us look at some, some incidents. Let us start with the first one in one of Moses' writings in the book of Numbers. Remember, Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the book of Job. So Moses actually wrote six books in the book of Job. So let us look at one incident that happened and, and where they attribute it to God. And we explain why it was so. We'll look at the language. We'll look at the translation. We'll look at the mindset of it. We'll look at the actors. We'll look and see whether who actually did the talking and who actually did the action and why it was attributed to God, even though God is not involved. Numbers 11.31, follow from here. Now we are going into the deep waters. And there went forth a wind from the Lord. <laughs> Did you see that? And brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp. Now this one is about manna. As it were, a day's journey on this side. And as it were, a day's journey on the other side. Run about the camp. And it's as it were, two cubits high upon the face of the earth. That's a lot of, that's a lot of, of, of fowls. You know, two cubits is very, very high. Now quail, for those who know, quail is a type of, is a type of fowl. It's like it's like a it's like a chick it's like a hen, or a fowl. You know, um, it's like guinea it's like guinea fowl. They call it quail. Okay, so they, they, God made it rain supernaturally. We'll come to that. Verse thirty two, and it was very high, so everybody could get some. And the people stood up all that day and all night and all the next day. Look at that, and they gathered the quails. So quails can be like hen fowl or um um, um a guinea fowl. Okay. And it took two, it took the whole day, two days, three days for the, everybody in the camp of, 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 of Israel, over more than a population of over more than 1.6 million to gather it. He that gathered least gathered 10 homers. Homers is their, their, their system of measurement. And they spread them all abroad for themselves, run about the camp. Verse 33. Now watch this. I want to show you something that is conspicuous in its absence, something that if you don't know how to ototomio the word, correctly put everything in the right place, like a seamstress or a fashion designer, when they give you the material, you jump to conclusion and say, ah, but Pastor Fred, it says it was God who was, who was angry and killed them. How can God give them meat and be the same one when they are eating, he'll kill them? Watch, verse 33, and while the flesh was yet between their teeth. So that is a figure of speech. It means whilst they were eating, er, it was chewed. The wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people. Who wrote it? Moses. Who wrote it? Moses. He just wrote what he saw. There was no explanation. We'll find out. And the Lord smote the people. He said what? He said what? The Lord did what? Smote the people with a very great plague, 34. And he called the name of that place Kibro Tatava. Kibro Tatava. Because there they buried the people that lasted. That is a key word. See, see, the Bible explains that don't, you don't rush it. There, that's the word. The people were destroyed. So it's not even God. That word lasted is the is the Greek word epitumia, which means strong, stubborn will not to obey. Ah, see that? So it's coming back to believing or not believing. So that means that it is not everybody will find out. Let's go on. We will see a similar situation of a plague occurred to the congregation of Israel in chapter 16 of Numbers. Let's look, let's read that. We are now doing a very investigative analysis. So follow me, follow me. Don't miss this one. Don't miss this one. Don't miss this one. Numbers 16, 44. And the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, 45, get up from among this congregation that I may consume them. Huh? I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. 46. And these are things when you read, if you don't know how to Ototomio, correctly divide the word, you jump to conclusion. Verse 46, and Moses said unto Aaron, take a censer and put fire therein of, of the altar and put an incense. Do you know that somebody can take this and use it to preach to believers? Do you know that somebody can take this and put fear? Hey, I am telling you, you see the Bible says, the Bible says that God in Numbers 1644 was very angry. He was consumed with anger and he consumed them. I'm telling you, child of God, if you mess around with God, if you don't bring this, if you don't bring God will consume you. Ah, 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 You have not autotomued the word correctly. Let's go on. Take a censer, put fire therein off the altar and put on incense and go quickly into the congregation and make an atonement for them, for there is wrath gone out. You see, you see, you see? 
Who is writing it? Moses. We'll explain why. Yeah. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. 47. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation and beheld the plague was begun was begun among the people and he put an incense and made an atonement for the people 48 and he stood between the dead and the living <laughs> and the plague was stayed 49 now that they died in the plague were 14,700 beside them that died about the matter of Korah somebody can use that to scare now do you know that according to the law nobody could go into the holy of holies except you were high priest the high priest were of the Levitical order. They were specifically chosen. Do you know that Moses was not a high priest? Moses was a prophet, was a leader. But do you know that Moses was the only person that could go in and out, in and out of the Holy of Holies? Nothing happened to him. <laughs> no, Moses just walked in and out. Nothing happened to him. Nothing. David also came sometime. He was hungry. The shoe bread, the shoe bread that was for the service in the tabernacle for God. He and his soldiers came from war and they were very hungry. There was no food. Without any protocol, David entered. Any other high priest that tried will fall down, will fall down and die. It's not God who is killing them. I'm coming. Oh. But most David went in, took the bread, and they ate it and they left. Nothing happened to them. Telling you something. I'll come to that. Follow me. Now, reading the pretext, it can be observed that Korah, because Moses and David knew some. And they understood some small revelation. They knew that the only way to be under God is to believe. If you don't believe, you are outside. And Israel was not believing, but they believed. So reading the pretext, that is the passage before, the verse before, it can be observed that Korah and his company expressed rebellion, one, disobedience, two, which is unbelief, you see? Now, once again, let me go back and show you where people make mistakes by using this to preach. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. Where are we? Numbers 16. So if I go into Numbers 16 and I take this Bible verse out, what mistake have I done? I have not gone to Numbers 15 because it is a continuous story. You see, I didn't go to Numbers 15. I didn't go to Numbers 14. I didn't go to Numbers 13. I didn't go to Numbers 12. I didn't go to Numbers 11 to find out what was the condition before they got here, you see? So if you are not schooled in this correct way to interpret the Bible, you will be deceived. And this person can take this verse and preach it for one hour. And at the end of it, now you are coming out of church, you are troubled, you are confused. Hey, then you start, hey, then who can make it with God? You know, it has taken something away from you. That is why Paul said in Galatians chapter one from verse seven, he said, if anybody comes to us and preaches to you another gospel, which is not another, he said, by that they unsettle you. The word unsettle is terazo. After it, it's like you don't feel like you're born again. After you feel so, so over guilty. Let me, and let me correct this. The Holy Spirit is not the one that convicts you of sin. You have not read that Bible verse in John chapter 16 very carefully. He says he convicts the world, the unbeliever of sin. But as of that righteousness is available, the conviction is by the way of the preaching of the gospel. You remember in Acts chapter 2, when Peter stood up and preached, the Bible says the people there, the unbelievers, were pricked in their heart. So the Holy Spirit is not the one that convicts you of sin. No. He does not. Rather, what happens is that you are born again. So let me put it this way. It's like somebody who you have lived in Africa all your life. You are used to the heat. And then you come into Europe. You are not used to the cold. So when you come into Europe, you know, you feel out of place because you are not used. See, when you are born again, you are no more used to the old life. That is why you are feeling out of place. But it's not the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin. It's your new nature that is not used anymore to that. That is all. So once again, if you don't take care, you the person will use this and let you feel guilty for nothing. So now let's go and uh, let's go and explain it. What was the problem there? If you go back to Numbers eleven, it was because of the people who did not believe all the instructions that God gave via Moses was for them to believe. Remember, anytime God gives instruction in the Old Testament, what was it about? Salvation by faith in Christ in a typology. See that? 
So Numbers 11, 1, and when the people complained, that's what they complained. The complaint is, when you complain, it means you didn't believe. It displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it. But now, once again, Moses, <laughs> you see, Moses, yeah, Moses, yeah, if you study a little bit about Moses, Moses was the only one that believed with Joshua and Caleb and some others. And he knew Israel did not believe. So he liked to put them under bondage. He liked to scare them. That is why when you read a lot of the Old Testament and when preaching comes from the Old Testament, it is full of scaremongering. Have you noticed? Scaring, scaring, put people under bondage. Legal. It's the same thing Moses did. God was not angry, but Moses wrote it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Because you have done this, God is angry with you. Just to put them under bondage. Because he didn't know how to control them. He didn't know that there was a problem with the Adamic nature that was causing it. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. We'll find out. Look at, look at, look at this one that people use. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost part of the camp. And the bull cried unto Moses. And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. Look at Moses. <laughs> and he called the name of the place Tabera because the fire of the Lord burned among them. And the mixed multitude that was also among them fell and lasting. That's the word again. And the children of Israel who wept again said, who shall give us flesh to eat? <laughs> this is so funny. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. He went on through all the things that you know, they're trying to remember the thing, the good things that they had. And many of them were weeping. And then he con continues again. And the anger of the Lord was killing greatly. What? Moses was Moses also was displeased. Ah 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 ah. Moses was displeased. Something's not right there. And the anger of the Lord was killed. And Moses. It appears to me that it's Moses who is angry. It's not God, and he's putting it that way. Let's go on. So it's the same thing. He goes to go through the motion. I don't want to go through that. So if you go to the conclusion, it talks about the anger and the wrath. So let's observe what it means then. So the phrase, the wrath of the Lord in the Old Testament, I've taught you this over and over, books of the Bible, is always used to describe the inactivity of God or the absence of God's saving hand due to man's disobedience and unbelief. And once again, the standard is the same. If Adam and Eve disobeyed, why didn't God let fire come from heaven? Because Adam's sin is greater than all. Because it was Adam's sin that brought spiritual death, mortality, eternal death, sin, sickness, disease, and the planet growing old. So why wouldn't he use fire to consume Adam when nothing like that ever existed? Because the Bible says that as through one man, sin entered. The word entered is the Greek word, esekomai. It means that that thing was not part of the creation of God. I would have thought that if there was any way that if God truly had anger, was to make sure that, ah, why have you introduced something that I didn't even create? Get out and destroy, every, and destroy him and burn him off. But he didn't. So how can he now use fire when the, the harm has been done by Adam's sin already? How can he kill some people when what they did cannot be compared to what Adam brought? You didn't hear me. How can he, God, kill people when the one who brought the main thing that brought all of us this, this woe, when what their own they did is nothing compared to what Adam did. Adam is the papa of all this. Adam is the papa of all this. They are only acting out of what Adam brought. So why? And remember, they, remember, 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 remember that the standard is the same. So that means there's something wrong with that statement. These are the things I'm trying to open your eyes to when you come across it. Now take your time and go behind and read. We said that the phrase, the wrath of the Lord in the Old Testament books of the Bible is used to describe the inactivity of God or the absence of God's saving hand due to man's disobedience or unbelief. So this wrath of God, I've explained it a thousand times. It is the use of a figure of speech that can be termed as metonymy. It is a figure of speech where a part is used to represent a whole or a whole is used to represent a part. Hence, 
it is called the wrath of God because God's goodness, one, God's mercy, two, God's saving power is absent in that sin. That is what they mean, wrath. It's not God, wrath coming from God. Let's continue. It should be, obsessed. no, let me read that part again. Let me read that part again because, you know, hence it is called the wrath of God as a figure of speech. Not English language wrath of God because God's goodness, one, God's mercy, two, and his saving power is absent in that sin. So when they say that when a person does not believe, the wrath of God abides on him, it's not the wrath coming from God, but it means that it means that you have decided not to choose God's mercy. You have decided not to choose God's goodness. You have decided not to choose God's saving power from sin. So spiritual death, mortality, eternal death, the curses of the law, all are still upon you. And so when you die, you are going to be in that place perpetually. That is all it, that's all it means. See that we are what, what are we doing? We are autotomioing the word correctly, putting it in its proper perspective in the light of Christ. So it should be observed in verse 44 to 48 that it was God's intervention that stopped the plague. Rather, Numbers 16 44, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 45, get up from among this congregation that I may consume them as in a moment. You will find out whether the consume was to kill. No. And they fell upon their faces and, and they did all the pleading. And Moses said to everyone, take a sense and put a fire there from the altar and put an incense. Go quickly into the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from them. That's Moses saying it. The plague has begun. Moses, you could see that Moses was panicking. Moses was panicking. God had not said. Moses was panicking. It was a panic, just like Job. Job, yesterday we read that Job was offering sacrifices in desperation. And I said that sometimes our fasting, our praying can be out of desperation, not out of faith. That is what is happening here. The same thing to Job. See that? And that's why sometimes it doesn't work. Some people think that 30 days, 30 days, 30 days, it's all out of desperation. You are doing it out of fear. You are not doing it in faith. See, you are doing that, you are just hoping like lottery. It's like lottery. Oh, today let me do 42, 47, 51. Maybe I'll get one million. Ah, it didn't work. Hey. Okay, next week, 62, 71, 74. It didn't work. Hey. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. So all your brain is out of desperation. You are just hoping somehow. You think that God is not hearing you. So, oh God, oh God, hear me, you, hear me, you, hear me, you. Oh God, you know what? I'll do 10 days. I'll do 10 days, 10 days, 10 days, 10 days, 10 days. No, 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 no. No. Study the Bible very carefully. Study the epistles. The reason, only reason why the apostles will fast was to be sensitive to the directions of the Holy Spirit, which, which is already there, but they are not, they are not, they are not, they are not, they are not catching it. So fasting is not to change God. God is the same one before you fasted. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not your fasting that will change God. That, no, fasting benefits you. God is the same before you fasted, and he's the same after. So most people do things out of desperation. Oh, but you have not read well that he said he has given it all to you already. All you need to do is to appropriate it by faith. You know, I always say this. God forbid that I will fast and pray for something that the unbelievers get without fasting. You didn't hear me. God forbid that I will fast and pray for something that the unbelievers, they don't pray and fast and they get it. Have you seen unbelievers? If he says she wants to buy a house, he just goes and buys a house. If he says she wants to do a business, he just does the business. I'm not saying that prayer and fasting is, is, is wrong, but I'm just letting you know that sometimes we, we our, 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 our motive it's put in the wrong place. Are you getting what I'm saying? Our motive, unbelievers, uh, oh, all the companies that are in the world, about 90% of them belongs to unbelievers. They are the ones giving we believers employment. They don't pray and they don't fast. So God forbid that I'll pray and fast for something that the unbelievers get. They get it without praying and fasting. Some of them have got cars and houses. They don't pray and fast for cars and houses. Some of them, the number of cars and houses can pay for some of these school fees for 10 years. I'm, I'm not kidding you. The, the, the car alone that they bought. So, so where do we put that equation? And then people are going to mountain, mountain. God do it for me, oh. God do it for me, God do it for me. And the unbeliever just walks in, he puts his plan together, 
He decides what he wants to do. He brings partners on board. They sit down, they map out their plan. No prayer, no fasting. They don't even think about demons. They don't think, they just put it together. They say, when they face opposition, they, they change their plan. They sit down, they call in experts. They look at the thing. Mm, all right, okay, let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. Let's do it. Eventually, the thing just goes through. Then they continue. That's all. They build bridges without prayer. They build skyscrapers without prayer. And we go and live inside buildings built by unbelievers. We sit in planes built by unbelievers. <laughs> I thought I would throw that. So here, Moses was just in desperation. So in verse 48, Aaron stopped the ongoing destruction by obeying Moses' instruction from God. Verse 48, and he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. The narrative of this incident showed that God's inaction in sin Unbelief. You see, the narrative of this in, in, incident shows that God's inaction in sin, see, which is unbelief, unbelief, which makes way for the destroyer, the devil and evil spirit, is what is called the wrath of God by man. Hey. They didn't know that there was a devil, they didn't know there was evil spirit. Now, some of you, when we say this, try to spiritualize. I mean, I'm from I'm an, I'm a very African boy, and I know you African. You know, I've, I've grew, I grew up in my village. I have seen people do juju. Uh, sorry for using juju. Um, fetishism. The French call it maraboutage. Whereby the evil spirits can summon rain. They can summon lightning. They can summon thunder. Because it's elements. It's just there. It's power. And the believer also has got that power as well. You can stop the rain like you know, some of the prophets in the Old Testament did. So, so it is atmospheric. So it's not, it's not something that is exclusive to God. Demons can do that as well. And God is not even involved in that action. But they didn't know that, you see. They didn't know that. They didn't know that. Let's look at Exodus 4. Let's go back a bit. Let's go to Exodus. Let's look at another statement that seems to suggest that God is the one that killed the person. What are we doing? We are ototomioing correctly explaining the word of God in the light of Christ. If you don't know this, you'll jump to conclusion. Have you noticed that all these problems is from the Old Testament? See that? That is why if you don't know how to correctly explain the Old Testament, you will jump to conclusions. Exodus 4, 24. And it came to pass. What mistake have I done again? I didn't go to Exodus 4, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, Exodus 3, Exodus 2, Exodus 1. See? So if you just take this out, you'll miss the whole thing. And it came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him and sought him to kill. You will see this and you jump to conclusion. Ah, Pastor Freddy, Pastor Freddy. But in Exodus 24, he said that the Lord met him and sought and killed him. Have you read all of it? Have you read the whole thing? Did you read the chapter before? Did you read the chapters after? No. Why are you doing that? Verse 25, then Zipporah observed. Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, surely a bloody husband had thou to him. Verse 20 said, so let him go. And then she said, a bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. Now, looking at the highlighted statement in the immediate text above, a vital question we quickly need to ask is this. Hmm. So when you read the Bible, ask questions. What could Moses mean by the Lord sought to kill him? As I always say that, if you start in the Old Testament, you'll be confused. Because the epistles, Acts to the book of Revelation, they explain the Old Testament. And I always say this, until you master the epistles, the Old Testament will never make sense to you until you read the epistles over and over and over and over. Then they, it will be clear. It will be clear. Paul calls the epistles revelation knowledge because they explain all these things that were not there. They explain. So if you like going too much into the Old Testament, you'll be confused. And you know what they do to us? They just throw the Old Testament at us. They don't, they don't allow you to. When you go to play, ask them, have you read the, the, the verse before? Have you read the verse after? Then why are you saying this? So let us explain that. Then we'll close for today. 
Oh, my time is up. What could Moses mean by the Lord sought to kill him? The phrase, the Lord, here was translated from the Hebrew word Yehovah or Jehovah. In the Hebrew, it has no vowels. What are the vowels? The E, the O, and the A. The E, the O, and the in the Jehovah, Yehovah, Yahweh, was not in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it is Y. H V W W H, but they pronounce it Yahweh. It means the Lord who is I am the I am, but it actually means I will be what I will be. The Lord who will become a man. That's the meaning of it. The Lord who will become a man. Because all the prophecies was about that. That's why I said, and the word became flesh. Finally. So, which is used by the Jews, by the Jews oftentimes to refer to God Almighty. Exodus, look at it. Exodus, follow me here. It's unfortunate that my time is up. Exodus, this was the very important part I wanted to come to. Exodus 6 3. And I appeared unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. So what he meant by, by the name Jehovah was not I known. They didn't know that revelation that God will become a man. <laughs> that revelation was they, they could they were spiritually dead. That is the revelation. The revelation of Christ is that God became a man. That is the greatest revelation. That is why if you go into First John, it says that anyone that does not believe that Jesus came into the flesh is the Antichrist, because it is the cardinal point of our of our understanding. And that is where the look at, look at all other so called religions. Islam does not believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. They just say he's one of the prophets, Antichrist, straight. Other religions also don't believe. They say, oh, how, 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 can, how, can, how, can be, how can he be God? I even know of a certain minister of the gospel. I don't mention him in America. She said when she got born again, she struggled with that concept. She was preaching, but she did not believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. She couldn't believe it. It took her years. That's why in 1 John, he says that anyone that does not believe that Jesus has come in the flesh. He is the Antichrist. So the Antichrist is not a person. The Antichrist is a teaching. It's a concept about Christ becoming man. So right now in heaven, we have a full man sitting in heaven. <laughs> but that his body is different from this body. It's called the glorified body or the immortal body. The same body we shall get when he comes at rapture. Rapture just means that we shall take on his body. So most of the time, the phrase, the Lord, and the word God in the Old Testament of the Bible, they were translated from the Hebrew word Elohim or Eloah. The L, the L, the E-L, which is used to refer to God, God like one, God like one, or God who became one as him, who became like man, God like one. See, do you, you see that? Or mighty one, mighty men, men of rank, men, men. Can you see men, men? So God will become a man, God. Sometimes also in the negative part, the L was used to mean false gods, demons, imaginations, or sometimes the L, depending on the context. See, that's why you have to look at the context. God, the true God, Jehovah, mighty things in nature. Therefore, whenever the word the Lord, careful, or God, and I want to correct something here. Those who pray and they say, oh, God, God. God is not his name. God is just a generic word to try and put all that God is into one word. But God is not his name. God is a generic. It's just a, it's just a general usage in English language. That's why he said that, that in, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 11, he goes on and says that, he says that, that even though he, Jesus, was God, did not think it as robbery, but he humbled himself unto death the death on the cross. Where, wherefore, God had highly exalted him and given him the name, the office that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus. So everything, whether it is El Eliono, whether it is El El Tikenu, whether it is Rohil, whether it's Raphael, whether it's Rohil, whether it's Tikenu, whether it's El Olam, whatever name that you find the Old Testament, they have put it all in one name. That is the name of Christ. So when you say in the name of Jesus, it represents all. 
You don't need to say Jehovah Mekadesh, Jehovah Tekenu, Jehovah Islam, Jehovah El Elam. You don't need that. No, the name of Jesus has absorbed all. Did you ever notice that Jesus never used the word Jehovah? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's not there. Did you also notice that from Acts all the way to the book of Jews, the apostles never used the word Jehovah, Jehovah Meshach, Jehovah Mekadesh. Jehovah, never. They just used the name of Jesus. They said, for that knowing that Jesus is the Christ, that's all they need. Therefore, when the Lord, when the, whenever the, 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 the word the Lord or God is used, it should not be assumed. This is a very important point as I end with it. In the Old Testament, anytime you see the word the Lord or God under the Old Testament, it should not be assumed, that's a typo, that the writer is always referring to God. In other words, the Hebrew language of the Old Testament allows for the word God or the phrase the Lord be used generally. That's what I said. For a deity or mighty being. That means it could be used even for demons. Let me give an example and let me close. You remember Saul of Tarsus who became Paul. When the light came and the voice spoke, he said, who are you, Lord? He was not referring to Lord as the Lord Jesus. The word Lord, there was just used like today's language, sir. Because in those days, they, they, they believed in the fact that, you know, deities are also called Lord. For example, they called Jesus that he's the prince of Beelzebub or the Lord of the flies or the Lord of the dung hill. You see that Lord. So Lord under the Old Testament and in some context does not always refer to God. You have to look at the context. Ah, this is Ototomio. <laughs> Glory to God. So God can be used in the Old Testament for generally for a deity or a mighty or mighty beings in nature. That's why under the Old Testament, they could see angels and they thought it was God. See that? Hence, in identifying who God or the Lord is referring to, the context of its usage. Oh, this is so important. And careful reading of the narrative must be carefully considered. Do you see why in the beginning I said that, you know, people just take Bible verses because they are not taking their time to carefully analyze and ototomio, the word of God, which is sweet like honey when you understand. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> oh, glory to God. <laughs> okay. Today is Friday. Normally Friday was our question time, but uh, there are no questions. Which means that you guys are really growing. You guys are really growing. The questions are reduced. It's a sign of spiritual growth. You guys are doing very, very well. Very, very well. Bless your ears. Bless your ears. Yes. Do we have any question or contribution? You guys are my best students. So, uh, so when examination time comes, don't, please don't, don't disappoint me. <laughs> Very soon we'll be electing after, you know, me and Lady P will be one round. Then sometimes we'll be electing some of to start. When the thing expands, there'll be another, you know, small uh, sort of Zoom for new beginners. And some of you will be teaching in that. Some of you will be teaching in that. So we are laying the foundation. Yes. Any questions or it is all clear. So once again, it's simple. Anytime you come across the word anger of God killed in the Old Testament, stop, don't rush it. Take your time and analyze. Go back to the chapters before and, it, and see if there was any link with believing or not believing or it's language. So don't let anybody come and throw those things at you. And, when, and can you see how when they are strong when they get to those verses? Hey, and God killed, and God killed this thing, and God killed this one. Hey, be very careful. I am telling you, God will, if you don't know, God will strike you. Oh, 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 bra, bra, bra. Pack and sit down, please. Hallelujah. Amen. Sister Ruti Ruti. Uh, the wonderful teachings. Yeah. Bless you. Bless you. Really Bless thank you. you. Every blessed day in our lives. In Amen. Our, yeah. Amen. Bless you. Bless you. Bless Me, you. I now understand that God doesn't kill. So even if I read anything in the Bible and I see any language, I know that this is not from God. Bless you. Bless you. That bless you. You've made my that is it. That's it. That's it. God will not be upset. That's God it. Will not kill. That's it. Destroy anyone. Emphatic. 
That's it. Set with me. That's it. The choice I make that brings all the untold hardships to me. So if I walk in God's ways as He's leading me, I won't see all those things. So why would I put my blames on God? No, 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 no. And I thank well God spoken. for that. Yeah. Well spoken. Well spoken. <laughs> it's well spoken. Me, the choice, like this morning, the food I ate. God didn't tell me to eat that food. So if my stomach is aching, why would I blame God for stomach ache? Bless you. That's I wisdom. That ate. That's and right. It's not like that. So I need to find a remedy for the solution. Not That's right. Call God's name and conjoin. No, 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 no. It doesn't work. Awesome. So God will have his peace because he's given us that power. That's right. To and combine and do whatever we want to do, you know? That's All right. To be. That's right. Well, Say it's what you will get. If I want that's to right. be a happy woman, I have to say I am a happy woman. That's right. That's right. I don't lack anything. I'm not a sick person. That's right. No one can do, I can do even better. Because I've got right. that power inside me. Bless you, sir. Bless God you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. If you don't do this, my God will kill you. It's all right. The go and the connect some juju and all of it. And then they come and control people's life with it. If you don't do this, if you don't give that, if no. you don't plant a seed, God will kill you. No. Bless you. Bless you. You've got it. You've got it. That's it. You've got it. That's it. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. I salute you for that. That understanding, once you've got it, that's it. I like what she said. She said that now she understands clearly that if she sees anything other than the Old Testament, it can never be God. It's language translation. Once you understand that, that's it. That's 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 clear. Well done. Well done. Well done. All right. All right. I think that is basically it. I've enjoyed it very much. So next week, by God's grace, we shall wrap this up and then we'll be done with that. Because once, you know, at least you I like what Sister Ruth said, you get that concept. So when you come across it, it just means that it's God is not involved. It's just a language problem, a translation problem. You know, so don't let isolated ones you know, sort of throw you off. You know, you have to read the whole thing together. Excellent, 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 excellent. I know that this is not the way. I mean, I didn't also know for so many. So I know that beginning is so we have been used to. It's the, it's the way we've been brought up. See, we've been brought up. Even in our schools, you know, what they call Bible knowledge, BK, all those things, you know, RS, religious studies. Or we see more, we see, isn't, isn't it sad that we see more of the so-called negatives but we want the apostles never preach like that. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. You know, we are back today for our prayer, last one for the week. And I say that you guys are always seriously amazing. Thank you, Sister Ruth. Bless you. Thank you, Sister Pauline. Whoa, Sister Pauline. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Thank you, Sister. Hey, Sister Hetty. Bless you. Bless you. I celebrate you. Good, good. Thank you also, Sister Sheila. <laughs> Sister Sheila, bless you. And also, Sister Nina, bless you all. Bless you, bless you. And of course, my own Lady P. You guys are amazing. Have a lovely day and a weekend. And we pray today in Jesus' name. Bye for now. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.